Welcome back Gothamites. If you're new here, hi. <laughs> I'm London aka History of the Batman. 75 years ago this year, Batman's secret underground lair where he housed his gadgets, Batmobile, and trophies was officially called the Batcave. For this video to celebrate this anniversary, I will give you 75 facts for 75 years of the Batcave, covering the evolution of this important part of Batman's iconography in comics, film, TV, and video games. Which I'm already going to tell you is going to be long. I just started filming this, but I know it's going to be a long video because I'm giving you a lot of information. So grab a snack, <laughs> grab something to drink, settle in because you're in for a very long, but very fun and fascinating ride. <laughs> Before you do strap in, why don't you subscribe to this channel and become a part of this wonderful Gothamite community. All right, let's begin. The first place we see Bruce Wayne house his bat suit is in a wooden chest and not a bat cave of any kind. In the July of 1939 story, The Batman Meets Dr. Death, which was published in Detective Comics issue 29. We see both the wooden chest bat suit in a new secret laboratory, which is hidden behind a secret wall in his room. In November of 1939, Detective Comics issue 33. In 1942's Batman number 12, the reader is introduced to Batman's Hall of Trophies representing over 1,001 victories, which included a large penguin and a joker mask. Also in this issue, we see an evolved secret underground hangar that is below Wayne Manor and includes a place for Batman's Batplane, Batmobile, and a secret lab. The term Batcave was first used in Columbia Pictures' 1943 black and white serial series, Batman, which starred Lewis Wilson as Bruce Wayne and the Caped Crusader. Also introduced in this film series is Bruce Wayne entering the Batcave through a grandfather clock. In 1944's Detective Comics 83, in the story Accidentally on Purpose, the secret underground hangar is called the Batcave for the very first time in comic books, which of course was influenced by Columbia Pictures' Batman serials. In 1946, after Batman and Robin visit Dinosaur Island, as a trophy, they take home a robotic dinosaur, which would become the well-known giant T-Rex within the Batcave. Another fun fact is that the dinosaur was first a brontosaurus, but then slowly was changed into the T-Rex that you know today. In 1947, another iconic trophy made its way into the Batcave, which was the giant penny in World's Finest issue 30. While many believe the giant penny in the Batcave has always been attributed to Two-Face, it was actually the small-time crook that named himself the Penny Plunderer, who terrorized Gotham with his penny-themed crimes. Before the Bat Computer became a major thing within the Bat Cave, Batman had an extensive criminal filing system that used microfilm. And this was first seen in the 1945 story, The Trademarks of Crime, which was originally published in Batman 31. At one point in the Bat Cave, Batman had a truth chamber where he ties up a crook to a chair in a room that is wall-to-wall -wall mirrors and with different color changing lights, it is designed to make a criminal talk. And you first see this in 1948's Detective Comics 134. So it was basically like a torture chamber for crooks, but he doesn't really torture them in the traditional sense. Batman has his ways. <laughs> the trophy room leaves Wayne Manor and officially has its own spot within the Batcave for the first time in 1948's Detective Comics 137, where you can see the T-Rex, the giant penny, and even a large Joker mask. In Bill Finger's 1948 story, The Thousand Secrets of the Batcave, trophies such as the T-Rex, the giant penny, and even Penguin's mechanical umbrellas were destroyed when an escaped prisoner breaks into Wayne Manor and discovers the Batcave. And of course the dynamic duo have to stop him. But don't worry, the crook unfortunately dies because he drowns in like the moat that is around the cave. So their secret is still safe between the dynamic duo and Alfred. <laughs> To stop crooks from breaking in after acquiring their 1,000th trophy, in 1950's Detective Comics 158, Batman installs cameras in their great hall of trophies within the Batcave in the story, The 1001 Trophies of the Batcave. Now what's just another fun tidbit is that you can see within this story that Batman has like tagged 
each of his trophies with numbers. Like he'll say that this was number 44 and has like the date attached to the trophy to say exactly when he got it. It's just a very thorough system. <laughs> but should you expect anything less? No, you should. Batman isn't taking his bat suit out of the wooden chest anymore. Bless his heart. In 1950s Detective Comics 165, Batman has an actual full bat suit closet. In this story, we have a clip show of sorts showing the different times that Batman used these mini costumes. In 1951, Detective 177, after some of Batman's trophies have been stolen by an unknown thief in the Batcave, I'm telling you, the Batcave can be infiltrated so many times. You'll see that a lot in this list. Batman puts in extra security and installs an electric eye beam that triggers an alarm to alert the dynamic duo when someone is in the cave. That's not them. <laughs> Batman has an actual flying bat cave when he signs an agreement to not set foot in Gotham City in order to get a ransomed Robin back in 1952's Detective Comics 186. While there is no exact backstory to the giant Joker playing card within pre-crisis continuity, in Reed's 1952 story The Crimes of Batman, which was originally published in World's Finest 61, Batman stops Joker from stealing a human size deck of cards and that can easily be rationalized that Batman would take a giant Joker playing card and place it among his many trophies in his great hall within the Batcave. In 1954's Detective 205, Bill Finger gives the first origin story of the Batcave where Bruce Wayne recounts that after buying Wayne Manor, no he didn't inherit it yet, we aren't that deep into the mythos. While he was looking around the property and looking around the barn, he fell through the floor and discovered a huge cave filled with bats and eventually made this his secret headquarters. Entering the Silver Age, in 1964's Batman 164, not only did Bruce get a sporty upgrade to the Batmobile, but he added a secret entrance and exit on the side of the mountain of the Batcave that can be used with the Batmobile. In 1964's Detective 328, a special hotline was established that Commissioner James Gordon can use to call Batman and Robin at any time directly from the GCPD to the Batcave. And just a bonus fact within this fact, this issue is the same one where Alfred Pennyworth dies while trying to save Batman and Robin from getting crushed by a huge boulder. And Alfred is out of comics for a very brief period of time. But following into our next fact, <laughs> in 1966's Detective 351, when Aunt Harriet comes to live with Batman and Robin after Alfred's death, she stumbles upon the Batcave of course, because everyone does apparently. <laughs> but because of this, Batman makes an actual device that assures that only Batman and Robin are able to find the secret Batcave and enter and exit it. So it took a few decades, but he realized I need to implement this <laughs> within my security systems. The Batcave made its way to the small screen in the live action TV series Batman that began on January 12, 1966. Easily one of the most expensive sets within the 1960s Batman series, the Batcave cost over $800,000 to build. As you can see when Batman and Robin exit the Batcave with the Batmobile, the distance from the Batcave to Gotham City is 14 miles. Visually dominated by the Batmobile and the very elaborate Bat computer, there are technically 47 Bat signs within the Batcave. And just another layer in this fact, if you aren't following Bat labels on Twitter and across social media, you definitely should because that's what they're dedicated to, to showing you the different Bat signs throughout the 60s series and it's just a lot of fun. <laughs> For one reason or another, throughout the 1960s Batman TV series, several people besides the dynamic duo and Alfred Enter the Batcave. From the Penguin and the Joker who sneak in in the episode The Penguin Declines, to even the henchwoman Molly who actually dies in the Batcave. She's the only one in the show, by the way, <laughs> who dies in the Batcave. So I don't know if that's like a special thing for her. Like, ooh, I'm the only one that died. I don't know. But sorry. Even Batman was very remorseful that Molly died. He doesn't want people to die. Why would he? 
The debut of the Joker card in the Batcave comes in the imaginary story The Bride of Batman, which is in the pages of 1969's Superman's Girlfriend Lois Lane, issue 89. In Frank Robbins' 1969 story One Bullet Too Many, after Dick Grayson decides to finally go to college and attends Hudson University, Bruce Wayne and Alfred Pennyworth decide that Wayne Manor is just way too big for just them and decides to actually leave Wayne Manor, including the Batcave, and sealing it up and living in the penthouse that is within the Wayne Foundation building. So while Batman is kind of on his solo adventures while Grayson is at college, the Batcave is technically out of commission and is retired. But Bruce has a backup mini bat cave that's in an unused subway tunnel beneath the Wayne Foundation and has transferred many of his necessities from the bat computer to gadgets. Even though the main bat cave was out of commission, throughout the Bronze Age of the 1970s, Batman would here and there use the bat cave, especially when Robin the Teen Wonder would come back into town. One time was in Batman issue 222 when the dynamic duo needed to help a version of the Beatles, which is one of my favorite stories of all time because I am a Beetle fanatic. <laughs> Another memorable time that the Batcave was used while it was out of commission in the Bronze Age was in Dennis O'Neill's Batman issue 232 when you are introduced to Ra's al Ghul who infiltrates the Batcave and knows Batman's secret identity. Everyone can break into the Batcave, I'm telling you. But not only did Roz meet Batman in the Batcave, but he also said that he kidnapped Robin and he has to find him. It's a crazy story because you discover that Robin really wasn't kidnapped and it was all a test because Roz wants Batman to be the heir of the League of Assassins and he wants him to be with his daughter Talia al Ghul and it's it's a whole thing. <laughs> the Batcave was also seen in animation throughout the late 1960s through the early 1980s in shows such as Super Friends and The New Adventures of Batman, which predominantly showed the Bat Computer, which was voiced by Lou Scheimer. In 1982, Bruce, Alfred, and Dick Grayson move back into Wayne Manor and reinstate the Bat Cave, which includes moving all of those huge trophies back in the Bat Cave in Lynn Wein's story, Shadow Play in Batman issue 348. Jason Todd discovers the Bat Cave accidentally like everybody else in 1983 September Comics 526 which began the events leading him into becoming the second Robin the Boy Wonder after Dick Grayson. In 1985's Who's Who in the DC Universe, the reader is given specs about the interior of the Batcave, such as it and its sealed off tunnels are made of limestone, and there are camouflaged doors that can only be entered and exited with the Batplane or the Batmobile or the Batboat. The Batcave is seen in a possible alternate future in Frank Miller's 1986 four issue arc Batman The Dark Knight Returns, where most of the cave has been closed down and is covered in white tarps because Bruce Wayne has retired from being the caped crusader. You see a very minimalistic and gothic style cave filled with bats in both of Tim Burton's 1989 film Batman and the sequel 1992 film Batman Returns. It showcases the Batmobile on a high turning platform, a very dark and metal bat computer, and a huge metal casing to house You hear that? He's getting comfortable and going <laughs> Anyway. And a huge metal casing to house the bat suit. In 1989, Secret Origins of the World's Greatest Superheroes, you learn about Bruce Wayne's discovery of the Batcave. And instead of him finding it when he's an adult, he finds it when he is four years old, when he falls into the cave that is filled with bats, which already begins his intense fear of bats. This age that Bruce finds the Batcave is reinforced in Denny O'Neill's story Shaman, which was originally published in 1989's Part 2 in the publication Batman Legends of the Dark Knight. 
After Bruce returns from his travels and comes back to Gotham, him and Alfred go to the Dark Cavern, and Bruce decides that this would be a great secret lair to house things such as his full-sized lab, a gym, and his secret criminal files. The Batcave is presented in the classic DC animated universe and is very similar in style to the Burtonverse Batcave, except Bruce made an exact replica of the secret lair of his childhood TV hero, the Grey Ghost, who was voiced by the late and forever amazing Adam West. The Batman the Animated Series episode Almost Got Him finally links the giant penny with Two-Face when Two-Face uses this giant coin to try and kill the Batman. In Batman 497, which is the climactic issue of the series Batman Nightfall, the villain Bane breaks into Wayne Manor and beats up Batman not just in Wayne Manor, but throughout the Batcave, which in turn ruins certain trophies. He slams him in the Bat computer. He even slams him in the Batmobile, and the whole cave is wrecked. And this is all right before he breaks his back. <laughs> After this encounter, Alfred Pennyworth and Tim Drake use the Batcave as a sick bay of sorts to try to help recuperate Bruce, who has been physically and emotionally broken by Bane. While Bruce is healing from his injuries, he makes John Paul Valley the new Batman, who seals off not only the entrance to the Batcave, but also to Wayne Manor to literally isolate himself so he can build more <laughs> deadly weapons and even keep out the current Robin, Tim Drake. While Bruce eventually gets better and defeats John Paul Valley's Batman and takes back the mantle, he briefly has Dick Grayson be the Batman of Gotham City. During this time, Bruce actually sets up satellite bat caves on his properties and in abandoned properties throughout Gotham City because he never wanted to feel unprepared again after facing the vicious Bane. Look at him, isn't he just so cute, Bane? He wouldn't hurt a soul except he, he hurt lots of souls. Outside of comics, the Batcave was featured on the big screen once again in Joel Schumacher's 1995 film, Batman Forever, which included a secret tunnel system that Bruce Wayne can travel through a capsule from Wayne Enterprises straight to the Batcave undetected. I know people give crap about Batman Forever, but that actually is pretty cool. <laughs> in Schumacher's follow-up film, 1997's Batman and Robin, there's both a turntable platform for the Batmobile, similar to Batman Forever, and a holding place for Robin's cycle, which is all lit up in really bright neon lights to give the campy vibe of the film as a whole. In Batman Shadow of the Bat 73 from 1998, a 7.6 earthquake hits Gotham City and not only wrecks all of the buildings in the city, but also Wayne Manor and the Batcave. It's all completely destroyed. The effects of Cataclysm turned Gotham into a no man's land, which was explored in the huge 1999 massive DC series. In No Man's Land Secret Origins and Files issue 1, it is explained how Barbara Gordon's Oracle and Bruce Wayne kept communication through different satellite bat caves throughout the city. There was the central Batcave that is below Robinson Park, Batcave South in a boiler room, the Northwest Batcave in an abandoned basement in Arkham Asylum, and Batcave East in an oil refinery, which all four of these main Batcaves were completely hidden. In the 1999 TV series Batman Beyond, there is a display case that shows Batman family costumes ranging from Robin to Batgirl to Nightwing to even Batman because Bruce Wayne's Batman at this point in the continuity has retired. In the 2001 animated TV series Justice League, during the Thanagaria invasion, the Batcave was used as a headquarters before the Watchtower was built. In 2004, Batman gained another Bat-centric TV series called The Batman, which follows the days of a very young Bruce Wayne. The Batcave was very high tech, but in this universe, Alfred was the one that came up with the idea of the Hall of Trophies. So that one day, the city will respect Batman enough to maybe give him his own Batman museum. The Batcave featured in Christopher Nolan's 2005 live-action film Batman Begins 
actually has a very long history where the cavern was utilized by the Wayne family for the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. In Batman Begins, the Bat Cave in Bruce's early days was very minimalistic, but the entrance to the cave with the Batmobile was through a huge waterfall, which is relatively new to the mythology of the Bat Cave at this point. In Batman Begins and throughout the Dark Knight trilogy, instead of a giant grandfather clock entrance, you can access an elevator to the dark cavern by playing three specific notes on a piano that's in front of this secret entrance. One of the most modern, elaborate back caves was designed by Jim Lee for Frank Miller's All-Star Batman, which you see for the first time in 2006's issue 4. There's platforms displaying Batmobiles over the years, there's display cases with costumes and armor, there's tons of high-tech weaponry, and of course you have the giant T-Rex. Dick Grayson even notes that the cave seems like it goes on forever. In 2008's Batman sequel film, The Dark Knight, Bruce has his Batcave in an underground bunker that houses his Bat computer, tumbler, and his Bat suit. And unlike most Bat caves, it is very lit with fluorescent lighting. In Michael Green's concluding chapter to K in 2008 Superman Batman issue 49, it is shown that in a secret place within the Batcave, Batman has all different types of kryptonite, which of course is the weakness for Superman, just in case Supes ever decides to go rogue. T-Rex is actually used to attack the villain Hush, and he not only infiltrates the Batcave, but also changes his face to look like Bruce Wayne in Paul Dini's 2009 storyline, Batman Heart of Hush. During the events of Grant Morrison's Batman R.I.P., the Black Glove organization has taken over the Batcave and uses it for its own base of operation. After these events in a briefly missing Bruce Wayne, Dick Grayson as Nightwing and Alfred Pennyworth decide to put the Batcave back together and fix all of the trophies once the black glove is completely gone in 2008's Nightwing issues 152 to 153. But of course it isn't that easy because they have to fight the League of Assassins and it's a whole thing. <laughs> After Bruce Wayne's death in Final Crisis and Dick Grayson takes up the mantle as Batman, instead of using the Batcave, he wanted to have his own bat space and used a bat bunker under the Wayne Foundation building which sounds very similar to what Bruce used when he was living in the penthouse in the 1970s, but that's either here nor there. <laughs> so during his absence when he has apparently died, Bruce actually has to travel back to current Gotham City in Grant Morrison's limited series Batman The Return of Bruce Wayne. And in this 2010 series, we actually get a backstory on the Batcave, learning that A, it has been here since the beginning of time, B, during the founding of Gotham City in the 18th century, the caverns were utilized by the Black Pirate, and C, both of Bruce's ancestors, Joshua and Alan Wayne, not only constructed the major landmarks that Gotham City has today, but also built Wayne Manor and didn't know that it connected to the cave that would eventually become Batman's Batcave. In the video game franchise Batman Arkham, first introduced in 2009's Batman Arkham Asylum, Batman has a very small Batcave that's hidden actually under Arkham Asylum. And the Batcave can be briefly explored within the 2013 prequel video game Batman Arkham Origins. In the 2012 film The Dark Knight Rises, the Batcave is fully functional and includes a high-tech Bat computer, his armory for the Bat suit, bridges that help you go from one place to another within the bat cave that is surrounded by waterfalls and a place for the bat to park after it comes into the cave through a giant waterfall. In the 2013 animated series Beware the Batman, the bat cave isn't hidden behind a grandfather clock or a secret wall, but it's actually hidden behind the fireplace. And within Beware the Batman, the trophy room isn't inside the bat cave, but in Wayne Manor, very similar to its beginnings in the 1940s. In the New 52 story, Death of the Family, which was written by Scott Snyder in 2013, we are actually given an origin story to the giant Joker card. Finally, <laughs> Batman tells the Bat family one of his first encounters with the Joker and that when he returns to the Batcave, he finds a Joker playing card, meaning that 
perhaps the Joker found how to get into his Batcave. But because of this, he created an oversized replica of that card to remind himself of the constant games that his arch nemesis plays with him, which is a huge understatement. <laughs> in the DC Extended Universe, we are introduced to the Batcave in 2016's film Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, which stars Ben Affleck as Bruce Wayne in Batman. And instead of the Batcave being directly under Wayne Manor, because it is very decrepit, Batman actually has his Batcave on the outskirts of the manor, and Bruce and Alfred have a nice glass house that is directly above the Batcave. In 2017's Justice League, Batman expands his Batcave and even invites the Justice League members such as Aquaman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Cyborg into planning how to stop Steppenwolf and to bring Superman back to life. In this film, you see a more expanded secret hangar than the minimalistic one from Batman v Superman. And on the current Fox TV series Gotham, there is a cave that is inside of Wayne Manor that Bruce Wayne throughout the series has continually used to train and slowly become the Batman. Thank you guys so much for watching a complete history of the Batcave with 75 facts for 75 years of this iconic piece of Batman's history. It's just to wish a happy 75th anniversary to this amazing piece of bat iconography. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a bat, a bat, a bat, thumbs up. As always, all of my social media is linked in the description below, including Instagram at History of the Batman. Why don't you go check out my merch store and support History of the Batman and get a t-shirt like the one I'm wearing now or get a phone case, or a pillow, or anything, a sticker. Just support History of the Batman. Any and all support, of course, is always greatly appreciated. Check out my reviews for Kamikazity. Check out the DC Fans channel because I am reviewing the book Goddess Mode and it is very awesome. And of course, please subscribe to this channel so you can become a part of this Batman community. It would mean so much to me. Thanks so much for watching and we will have more History of the Batman soon right here on YouTube. Remember, Gothamites, it's all about peace, love, and Batman. Bye.